Hello class, welcome to part two of our digital lecture. To continue, signal to noise ratio is another way of measuring the quality of an image. Noise, as you can see here, limits our ability to see objects. Noise is the equivalent of a very grainy image. So the signal to noise ratio is used to describe and detect the ability to resolve an image and to show that image in a level of brightness that's understandable. So when we have more signal to noise, that's signal versus noise, we get a much brighter signal. Uh, signal to noise can also be uh, measured in line pairs per centimeter, similar to uh, when we discussed spatial resolution, as well as with your modulation transfer function your MTF, where we said zero is the worst possible scenario, where you're not visualizing any of the information from the object versus one, which would be the best. And of course, both of those are unrealistic. Zero would indicate that your machine is completely not working. One would be as if you were taking the object, such as an exploratory surgery operation, taking it out of the patient and looking at it in your hand, and that's uh, not going to happen, which is why we have imaging. If we want to increase our signal, generally speaking, the best way to do that is to increase the radiation to the patient, uh, which is the downside. So an increase in mass, milliamp per seconds, would typically increase our signal to noise ratio. And the way this is manifested would be a much brighter image. So contrast to noise resolution is very similar to signal to noise ratio. Basically, we're looking at the ability of the imaging system to distinguish structures that are in close proximity. So that sounds like spatial resolution. But now we're talking about being able to distinguish very small shades of gray or the contrast between them, the ability to distinguish slightly different attenuation differences that these tissues may have had as the x-rays were going through them. Another way that this is termed is sometimes the sensitivity of the image receptor. Uh, sensitivity of the image receptor is also another way of saying <laughs> speed, uh, whereas if we remember in the screen film world, a faster speed actually leads to less detail versus a slower speed giving us better. Uh, contrast resolution can also be described using the value known as contrast to noise ratio or CNR. Uh, and as with signal to noise ratio, the contrast to noise ratio is defined as the contrast that's seen in the image divided by the amount of noise that's existing in that image. Uh, if you do the math, the idea here is that when you reduce noise, you increase contrast. So the two are inversely proportional to each other. Anything that we could do to reduce image noise will increase the contrast or the contrast to noise ratio. Potentially, that might give us the ability to see a small lesion that might not appear had you had more noise or graininess to your image. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the computer systems in the hospital. Starting with the largest system that exists is your HIS, or your Hospital Information System. The Hospital Information System has just about everything imaginable that a patient would enter into the system, such as their billing information, um, their address, and a lot of other patient demographics. When we're taking an x-ray, do we need their billing information? Do we need to know if their payments are late? Uh, no, we just need their name, we need their date of birth, we need their medical record number. All of these are initially put into the HIS. And what we will do is take some of the information from the hospital information system 
and download it or pull it into our RIS, our radiology information system that you'll see on the next slide. So in the RIS, what do we actually need? Well, we don't have to recreate the things that have already been entered in the HIS system. So all we need to do is look up our patient, which hopefully is in a work list. So perhaps the secretarial staff would do this when they're creating that requisition that pops out of your printer, or when you go to the computer and look at the work list, all you have to do is click on the next patient. So what the wrist will do will steal some of that information from the hospital information system, and then you will need to add, or someone in the department will add, the fact that a chest x-ray has been ordered, for example. You will then uh, a, a session number will then be created and associated <laughs> with that examination, right? So patient's name is there, medical record number is there. Now we're talking about a new number and a session number that distinctly identifies the new exam that's being ordered and the day that it's being ordered. It's this session number that a radiologist will utilize with which to dictate a report. So they will pull up this session number. Now when your exam is done and your session number is there and you're ready to send your images, where do they go? Most of you are familiar because you've been in the hospitals now that when you're done with your image and after you've critiqued it for positioning and alignment and technique and all those things and determined that they are of a quality that is good enough to send to the radiologist, they need to be sent into the PACS database. Right? That's our picture archiving communications system. Right? The P is the picture that we're looking at. So the majority of what PAX is is an image storage database and an archiving of images. So if you were to go later on to PAX and put in that session number that we just spoke about, up would come the image that or set of images that you just did. If you were to put in a medical record number, you may get a entire list of all of the different procedures that a patient may have had. Uh, PAX is also based on communications, so there is a large network of computers that can feed from the PAX database. In other words, you go to a particular terminal where you put in patient information and then outcomes, not only images, but potentially the reports that were dictated previously by the radiologist. So PACS can also feed information to it from the HIS and the RIS system, so things don't have to be recreated. PACS has now extended outside of <coughs> just the hospital environment. Right? So there are web-based PACS that utilize the internet so radiologists can look and dictate from the comfort of their own home. There are security issues, of course, and those need to be taken care of by an entire staff. So there is an entire staff that is dedicated to taking care of the PAX system. You have PAX administrators, and in large hospitals, you may have several people that go around uh, and make sure that PAX is working, right? Because when PAX goes down, uh, it's bad news, right? Um, hopefully there are backups. As a matter of fact, there is a system known as RAID, which is a random or redundant array of independent disks that ask, acts as a backup system or a mirror to what's already there. Absolutely essential uh, to a functional PAX uh, for this information to be tracked electronically. Now, uh, before I go on to DICOM, just another word about PAX. PAX is basically expanding. They're finding that it is not only good for just ultrasound images, nuclear medicine images, radiography, special procedures, CT, MRI, all of the radiology things. 
Uh, PAX is now expanding into laboratory results uh, and other patient criteria outside of billing information and those kind of things that we said are maintained in your hospital information system. Now DICOM uh, is a standard, right? It's uh, digital information for communications in medicine. And a standard is a set of rules. So you can't really touch DICOM per se, but it is a set of rules that multiple manufacturers have agreed to utilize so that their systems can essentially speak with other systems. For example, your CT scanner is known as being DICOM compliant. If that's the case, it can talk to the radiation treatment machine and take information that is created from the CT scanner and utilize that for proper radiation treatment and planning. Another aspect of DICOM, and as you can see there are 16 major parts to DICOM that you are not required to memorize these, but DICOM covers a lot of different bases. Another example would be the grayscales on one person's monitor need to match up the grayscale on another. If two radiologists or a physician and a radiologist are consulting about a case and they're looking at two different monitors, you want that one image, that one slice per se, to look exactly the same on one monitor versus another. It's DICOM that makes this happen. And speaking of images and DICOM, the images that we put into PACS are in a DICOM format, right? a special file extension. Similar to a JPEG or a GIF, but it's a DICOM. So you cannot look at a DICOM image unless you have a DICOM reader. Images that we utilize in PowerPoints occasionally were DICOM images that have been converted into a different file format. Uh, without DICOM, there's a lot of confusion. You needed to have middleware or third parties to, to do lots of different conversions, uh, and it became very complicated. If you go back to uh, an example of a DVD player, a standard tells us that any DVD that you buy somewhere should be able to play in anyone's DVD player regardless of the manufacturer. So DICOM is attaching or linking many, many different modalities, right? Um, so all of these are tied together. And when it comes to workflow, you know, many of the errors uh, that are outside of just purely technical exposure errors uh, can occur. It's very easy to barcode the wrong requisition. It's very easy to double click on the wrong name and a work list and all of a sudden you take an image. That image may come out perfectly lovely looking except if it is linked to the wrong patient uh, that could be very bad for both people. Uh, so things like inappropriate documentation can occur. Uh, even digital images can be lost. Uh, images can be mismatched and there's a lot of corrupt data potentially. So it's very important to focus uh, on some of these little things like making sure you choose the correct patient off of a work list, make sure that you close your cases and that the timing is appropriate and that you don't wait a long time to send an image into PAX because if another image is done, let's say two portables were done, you know, one was done an hour later, but if that first image was not pushed through and comes in after the second image, then you have a reversal of times. And if you were looking at something, let's say line placement, it's going to confuse a lot of people. So very important to uh, expedite your case from beginning to end. So that's where it's very important to follow your hospital protocol. Windowing and leveling are simply digital mechanisms within CR or DR to change the contrast that would be windowing or to change the brightness of an image that would be leveling. So generally these work with a mouse click uh, where if you move the mouse up and down 
you are changing the brightness, the level. If you move the mouse left to right, you are changing the window or the contrast. There are several ways that uh, this can be done. You can also directly manipulate what's known as a histogram, which is this graph right down here. So you can kind of take your mouse pointer, click on here, and stretch out your histogram and actually change the contrast slash brightness of an image. When it comes to making exposure, and we talked about this in the first lecture, very important to choose the correct part, right? If the wrong part is chosen, the computer is going to interpret the exposure incorrectly. So if you do an angle, you need to make sure that you process that using the correct algorithm. You have to choose angle, right? If you choose a different part, what I had mentioned in the last lecture, or the first part of this lecture, is that it will go to a separate lookup table and try to make corrections and adjust your density and contrast but if it's trying to do that under the optimal conditions for let's say a skull x-ray and you did an ankle it has unpredictable results may come out too light or too dark also mentioned earlier we need to have enough mass enough radiation so that we can reduce the amount of noise again that will increase our signal to noise ratio of course we want to make sure that we only use a sufficient amount of radiation to adequately penetrate the part. Any more of that would be considered an overexposure. So here's an example where the knee on the right side looks a little bit light, not because less radiation was utilized, but because the wrong part was selected when processing this image for the reconstruction of this image. So as I mentioned a couple slides ago, a histogram is a graphic representation of the numerical tone values or the various densities that are in an x-ray exposure. Uh, all computer radiography systems have this in place and each has a specific name for this process. Right, so a histogram is going to be generated from the image data that is created. A computer is going to analyze, look for the minimum densities and the maximum densities and try to match that up. One of the things that we've discussed in the past is it's very critical to make sure that all the elements that we talk about in screen film still apply in the digital arena. Right? We still need to practice good collimation because these computers are analyzing the image to look for the borders of collimation. Uh, also very important to utilize our lead markers um, and they must be in the area that is exposed because if they don't show up, even if you had placed them, we might as well consider that they're not there. Additionally, we want to avoid overlapping exposures. This is why it's very common that multiple views are done on separate image receptors or separate CR plates. Anytime that collimation may overlap, such as if you did two views of the hand, a PA and an oblique, and you don't have two indis uh, distinct rectangles of collimation, if some of that overlaps, you're going to basically confuse the math, right? Um, so it will be interpreted as an area that has an increased exposure because when you overlap, what happens? The density in that spot gets much darker. Your histogram is going to try to fix that, and then ultimately it applies this particular solution to the entire image, and the results could be not what you were expecting or what you want. So a lookup table is really a particular histogram of the luminescence values that are derived during the image acquisition. This is basically the image data that is created when you take a radiograph. It's then used as a reference 
to a pre-existing lookup table that has been that has been designed through lots of trial and error and lots of studies to give you a, sort of an opti optimal lookup table for each part. In our laboratory, we don't have too many lookup tables because there aren't too many parts to choose, right? If we're doing a hand, wrist, elbow, forearm, there's only one button to press. But in the hospital, you may have noticed that there are many, many more options so that each lookup table is significantly more tweaked in such a way to be sensitive to that particular part of the body. Right, so this is going to map all of your pixels, right, and ultimately adjust them to fit the proper or what's deemed the best possible image. So this is where your correction occurs. After you take an exposure, if it would have been too light, the density and the brightness are adjusted. If it would have been too long scale, for example, the density and the brightness are adjusted to give you more of a higher contrast image. For instance, that would be associated with extremities. And when it comes to exposure, as I've indicated uh, many times, we don't have a visual cue like we did in the screen film environment. When an image comes out of a processor, the, the plastic image, if it's dark, we knew we overexposed the patient. All we have now is an EI or an exposure indicator, which actually isn't the amount of exposure that the patient received. It's the amount of exposure that was given to the plate itself. Some manufacturers, Fuji, Philips, Konica, utilize what's known as an S number for their exposure index. Other manufacturers call it what it is, an exposure index. Here's an example of your S numbers, uh, particularly for Kodak, Agfa, uh, and down at the bottom you have a few others. Okay, we're all... So the gross exposure index that's possible. In other words, the latitude, how much variance do we have when we're setting technique? Can we use absolutely anything? Can we set the exposure level that you might use for a hand on a KUB? Of course not. But in terms of CR exposure, we have about a 50% correction rate for an underexposure. So believe it or not, it is possible to use less radiation than we typically use in conventional screen film imaging, which is great. Uh, although, as we talked about when we mentioned in the first part of this lecture about radiation creep, there's a tendency to use more radiation versus less. And the reason for that is you have about a 200, as you can see on the right here, percent chance of fixing the image uh, with a large overexposure. So you have a better chance of correction or correcting that image if you overexpose than if you underexpose, but that shouldn't be the reason to use more than you think is necessary. And even with a overexposure, it is still possible that if you use an extreme overexposure that the system cannot fix or adjust the image and you get something that starts to look gray and washed out. That concludes part two of this lecture. I hope you find these videos useful, and I want to wish you good luck on your midterm exam.